Getting to uh, Elliot Spitzer, why was it so personal? Why was he after you, your family? What? You know, Steve, um, very hard to understand. Uh, I was on a conference call with analysts. This is now after Enron and, and the change that took place in corporate America. Uh, Sorbanes Oxley was mm -hmm. enacted, um, and boards were uneasy about almost everything. They all wanted their outside counsel. Um, so AIG had Dick Beatty representing the outside board. Um, um, I didn't, know, I didn't know him at all, and he, he was a jogging partner of Spitzer's, uh, which uh, uh, I didn't know, and it was too bad, but in any event. On the conference call with the analysts, one of them asked me, what's the regulatory environment like today? And I said, you know, a footfall is like a murder charge. I'm trying to describe the, the change that had taken place and how the overreaction was, Enron was Enron. Uh, it didn't represent corporate America. Right. Uh, and, and to suggest that it did by going so far over, the, over to one side, you were hurting the economy. You were hurting corporate America. They, boards were taking more and more power away from the CEO. So when I said that, um, one of Spitzer's deputies rushed into his office I found that out later and said, did you hear what Greenberg said on a an, conference call? He said, no. He, when he told him that, he says, I'm going to take Greenberg down. He used some other language. Yes. And, uh, and the reason I know that is because um, uh, Vacchio, who had been the attorney general, happened to be in Spitzer's office representing a client. He was a lawyer. And he said this in front of Vacchio who has an affidavit in the book um, as to what he actually said. I mean, for what purpose? For what? He was running for the governorship, obviously, mm -hmm. and he, you know, he, had, he went after big names in, in, in industry, uh, banking, insurance, whatever. Uh, and he was called the sheriff of Wall Street. I mean, the damage that he did to the state and to the economy. The billions of dollars of fines he collected and the, the harm that it did to companies' net worth and to shareholders' values is just un, unimaginable. I mean, uh, he, he, he relied on the Martin Act in New York, which was, you probably know, was an act in 21, yeah, yeah at, uh, where you didn't have to prove anything, where you just go after somebody. And uh, that law is still in, in effect in New York. And so that's, you know, that's what he did. Now, uh, he thundered about criminal charges. Yeah. He's going to hang you high. Yeah. What happened to those? Well, he dropped those, <laughs> he dropped those uh, on Thanksgiving uh, when nobody reads the newspapers. And uh, we're testing the Martin Act. Uh, we're up before the Court of Appeals now. And, uh, then it'll be heard sometime in April. And most of the civil is gone. Just about, the only thing left is two things that are just nothing. And they'll be gone. We'll win. Whether or not they want to concede victories, I can't tell you, but we're gonna win. I will not give up until we do win. Uh, was it for tactical reasons you settled with the SEC in 2009, or? Yeah, what happened there? First of all, it was a control party Settlement. In other words, I was a controlled party, therefore I'm responsible for everything that happens in the company. We were being, uh, we were in litigation with AIG. When we formed AIG, it was formed by a private company. CB Star Company is a private company. We put our assets, the insurance assets, into what we called AIG. We got back AIG shares. Now, nobody in America really knows what we did. Uh, Nobody in AIG had a contract in the company. Starting with me, I refused one. Uh, nobody made more than a million dollars in salary. I refused any raise above that in salary. We got a bonus if, we, if performance justified it. But what we, what, what we did do when we, got, when we uh, created AIG, um, we got 
we were the largest shareholder, of course. Um, and I had my colleagues and me agree that we would take 20% of the shares that we got, which belonged to us, but we voluntarily left them in the private company, in C.B. Stone Company, and created a compensation program uh, for incentive program for senior managers of AIG that performed well. And they got AIG shares that, from us, the private company. Uh, we held them in escrow until they retired. If they left, they gave up the shares. It was a very, very, it was great for AIG. They didn't pay any part of this. So they were suing me afterwards to get control of this private company, saying that it belonged to AIG. And that's like saying that the child uh, gave birth to the parent. Uh, it doesn't work that way. And so uh, uh, David Boys, my, my attorney, said we ought to settle this SEC thing before we go to trial on, on the question of who owns those shares. Of course, they belong to the private company. It didn't belong to AIG. We won that hands down. But he didn't want to muck the things up at that time, so I agreed to settle uh, on a controlled person basis. Uh, what you described as a, after the ouster, which really seemed to be a reaction, as you say, Sarbanes-Oxley, what happened to Arthur Anderson, doesn't matter the charge, if the charge comes, it right. can bring the company down. Uh, what you described as the, the Civil War. That's correct. Uh, petty stuff. Uh, no severance. That's right. Fooling around on chairs in the, the dining room table. Medical records of the dog. That's right. Uh, describe what happened to Redholm, uh, just as an example of this. <laughs> um, we, the, the Star Companies owned a agency in London that did aviation insurance. Uh, it was too tiny to have put into AIG when we went public. But we represented AIG uh, and at terms that were equal to the market or sometimes better than the market. And so what they did uh, during this so-called civil war, um, they locked our people out of the office, one thing. They, um, uh, they interfered with the business, wrote letters to all the clients that they shouldn't do business with right home. It was just disgraceful. I mean, it was just disgraceful. Uh, yet we had to defend ourselves, uh, which we did. And that wasn't the only thing they did. All of our valuable paintings, which belonged to C.B. Star and Company, yeah, not to AI. S-I-C-O-C. Yeah. Couldn't get them back. We had to sue for that. I couldn't get letters that my, my mother had written me, or I'd written to my mother during World War II. Um, uh, they refused to turn over any, any of my personal things. I mean, I couldn't believe it. After 40 years of building the biggest insurance company in history, uh, to have this happen. And it's the lawyers who took over on, be, on behalf of management and, and the board. The board gave up doing anything. And uh, quickly describe the contraattempt on the foundation. Yeah, which well. Cost millions of dollars. It was disgraceful. It was disgraceful. Over. Look, the Star Foundation has been one of the most generous uh, supporters of many things in New York, including, as you know, the New York Presbyterian Hospital, mm -hmm. uh, Rockefeller University, uh, so many things, and museums. Uh, in, uh, we, we probably have given away close to $2 billion in New York. Uh, when Star died, the foundation was worth $15 million. We built it up into billions. Of dollars. The high point was about five and a half billion, uh, which is not a bad rise. <laughs> um, so Spitzer accused the the uh, directors and the and the trustees of uh, of shortchanging the foundation uh, from uh, from what it was into, what it should have gotten, um, and so called didn't get. Well, we we hired. Foundation hired uh, Florence Davis, who was president of it, uh, hired a retired uh, surrogate uh, and a uh, retired Supreme Court judge. I had nothing to do with it. Um, they spent about a year, a year and a half, whatever it was, and verified that everything had been done according to the way it should have been done. Uh, how did all this come up? I'm told that a summer intern from school uh, went through the records, looking for things that, that Spitzer could uh, accuse us of. Hmm. I mean, it was just disgraceful, disgraceful. 
Do you think all of this stuff was what you might call a perimeter defense to keep you from doing a proxy fight? Were they just trying to wear you down? Well, they weren't going to wear me down, Steve. Uh, and I will never admit that I'm doing something wrong, but I did nothing wrong. I, you know, it's not, it's not my nature to do that. I just couldn't. Uh, I wasn't, there'd, there'd be no proxy fight. There was no point in the proxy fight. Uh, uh, you know, the environment changed. Boards of directors uh, took power away from CEOs. And it wasn't just AIG. It happened throughout, really throughout the, the country. And particularly where you have an attorney general who has aspirations to go higher in the political world. And who oversees the attorney general? Nobody. Who really, I mean, there's nobody determining whether or not he's acting within his rights uh, or not, uh, which we have to change in this state. I mean, why would anybody running a, a public company want to have their headquarters located here? With the Martin Act overhanging, and, and you get an attorney general who's, a, who's, a, who's looking to go higher, which is what happened. You know, you have this bitch, you had the governor, current governor, who yep. was attorney general. You got an attorney general now who I'm sure would like to be governor. And so, you know, you're, you're a sitting duck. It makes no sense. Going to 2008, why do you think look, looking at the company you created, the culture you created, seemed to fade so quickly after you left? Well, tight control, tight discipline. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to say, but a couple of things happened. Uh, we had a very good uh, risk management structure, uh, the best in the industry by far. Uh, you know, I chaired the New York Fed for a number of years, and uh, when one of the top risk managers there was retiring, early retirement, I hired him, and uh, and he worked with us. We already had a a risk management system, but we, be, we had an enterprise risk management system covering everything, market risk, credit risk, uh, underwriting risk, all of that uh, was really top, top notch. Uh, so what happened afterwards, the, uh, you had uh, Sullivan who was the CEO. Martin Sullivan. Yeah, uh, who, um, who abandoned the risk management system for, uh, for AIG financial products. What I'm told is that AIG Financial Products told Sullivan, we've got our own risk management. We don't need your people. And he agreed to it. Why is beyond me. And nobody challenged Sullivan on that. Uh, now, now, is it true when you were there, the rule was <laughs> if we're AAA, That's we stay right. in the business with CDSs. Right. If it's not AAA, we you, can't do it. You stop it. That's exactly right. And we hedged whatever we could, and we hedged most of the things. They had several choices. Stop, hedge, and don't write the same things that they wound up writing. They were, they were writing the, not the super senior tranches of, uh, of CDOs. They were writing something way less than that. And uh, look, it made a lot of money for us when we were there. And, uh, and we never, and, and if we lost a triple A, which we wouldn't have done if I stayed there, uh, we, never would, we never would have gotten to the kind of business they got into. And then apart from that, that Did they put float money into these yeah, things? Yeah, the other thing they did was uh, so silly. Uh, most uh, big insurance companies will lend securities to a, uh, say to a bank or to an investment bank, and you get, a few basis points, maybe five, seven, eight basis points, and it's invested usually in 30-day receivables. And uh, that's what we did for years and years. When I left, uh, they changed that strategy. They said we want 15 to 20 percent for money. So they went out way, way out on, on, more, on mortgage, more mortgage debt. And of course, that stuff came back to bite them. So were they too focused, as you put it, uh, with uh, referring to Arthur uh, Levitt, uh, off the rack <laughs> notions of good governance? Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, uh, Zob brings, look, did I make a mistake? Yeah, in some of the directors that, that I recommended for the board. Uh, and I have mind telling you, Frank Zob, who I did a lot for in his life, uh, turned out to be just, just a terrible person. Uh, uh, I helped Ellen Futter at the, at the museum. 
guy, Bernie Adenoff, came from uh, Selman and Cromwell, who was there when we created AI Chain. Um, uh, Dick Holbrook, who, uh, who I knew mm -hmm. for years and years. Um, what, what can you say? Uh, uh, February 2008, you write a talk in the book about PwC giving that extraordinary uh, letter of warning. Yeah. I think things were falling apart. Why didn't the more alarm bells go off? Well, I, I wasn't there. They went to, uh, they, they went to uh, uh, Williamstadt and said that... Um, this is the uh, chairman. Yeah, he was the chairman. Said that um, uh, the current management can't, can't run AIG. Why didn't he tell the board? Nobody said anything. In fact, right after that, they went out to raise $30 billion, didn't disclose it, in, the, in, their, in their papers. Why didn't the, the, uh, the auditing firm say something then? You know, very uh, strange. Come September, when the crisis is the hottest point, you offered to uh, meet yeah. for dinner yeah. to say, what, what, what can we do? Yeah. And they said, no. That's right. That's right. Only, the only concern that was going to overshadow them. That's really true. Yeah. And then uh, the Fed, Federal Reserve, which yeah. you described their actions as almost a soup kitchen That's exactly during, right. during, during, during uh, September. Why do you think the Fed said no, and why didn't they let AIG do what they let Goldman do and Morgan Stanley do, get a bank and therefore be able to get well, liquidity? Well, you know, the, um, there's no question that um, there are several things that the Fed could have done uh, and didn't. Uh, AIG should have been, had access to the Fed window. Everybody else did. Uh, even the Arab Bank, which was 26% owned by Libya when Gaddafi was still alive, got access to the Fed window by the Arab Bank. Um, Hartford was told get them get a license, and they which they did, and they got access to the Fed window. They could have done several things. They could have given a, a broker dealer license. Uh, they could have done what they did for Morgan Stanley and for Goldman and give them a bank holding company license. They had access to the window. Um, AIG, should have, they could have done what they did for Citigroup and guarantee uh, hundreds of, they did for hundreds of billions of dollars of assets. They had guaranteed AIG FP would have regained their AAA rating and it would have been over. No money would have changed hands at all. Uh, so there's a lot of things that could have been done but wasn't done. You made reference in the book. Who in the government discouraged AIG from going to sovereign wealth funds? I think Mark? it was Paulson and Geithner. Why? Because they might have been successful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, why didn't the company, uh, you also made reference, why didn't they go for, uh, for why no insolvency filing, which would have separated uh, financial products from the sound of yeah, the Yeah, I companies? mean, there are a lot of things you could have done, for example, um, the CDOs, there was no price discovery. Uh, there was no exchange to trade them on. Every broker dealer had a different price for the value of, the, of them. So why would you respond to any collateral calls until you had a price that you, you had faith was a representative price? You could have said, no, I'm not going to respond to any of them. Uh, until we have a meeting of what they're really worth and what you told us they were. You told us one thing, they turned out to be something much different than that. And I wouldn't have paid a dime of collateral. If you don't like it, the courtroom's around the corner, and uh, five years later we'll know who was right. I wouldn't have done anything. I wouldn't have paid a dime on this collateral. Do you also make reference to when the government nationalized AIG? Yeah. Do you think they really were just using it as a vehicle to pay 100 cents on the dollar to Goldman and others? Well, you think about what happened. A, they paid 100 billion. cents on the dollar, number one. Um, they forced AIG to give a complete release to the counterparties, and they put a gag order on. What does that sound like to you? <laughs> the suit that you have now, Yeah. Uh, obviously you are fighting it because you think you're right. but. Can you comment on the environment we have today? Because when you had the Chrysler GM bankruptcy, which violated every tenet of uh, bankruptcy law, the Indiana treasurer filed, 
and the courts threw it out, even though they knew Indiana was right, but they don't go against the government. Well, you saw today that the, um, the Court of Claims in, in Washington has given all the shareholders of AIG, or shareholders at the time, uh, the right to bring a direct action against uh, the government. And, um, and uh, David Boyes, our attorney, will handle that class action in accordance with the, with the, uh, with the uh, court's opinion and recommendation. So we're making a lot of progress. And, uh, you know, look, it's a lawsuit. I, I believe that we can show that, that the government took control of AIG, did not, did not do it properly, did not give the, they can take whatever they want under the Constitution. We've got to pay for it. You know, there's a takings clause in the Constitution. Yeah, Fifth Amendment. It's not there by accident. Uh, and uh, you want to take AIG, which is one of the great countries of the world, you have to reimburse the shareholders. You can't just take it. It was wrong. You know, thousands and thousands of employees spent a lifetime helping build that company. Um, pension funds, we had such a great record, pension funds and investors from all over the country and the world invest and bought shares in AIG and, and they were happy with that. They lost all of that. And that's just wrong. It shouldn't happen. This is America. That shouldn't happen. Well, good luck, Hank. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.